Wrecker. Hey, Nick. How you doing? Good. While I was waiting for you. <laughs> you were waiting for me, true, true. I was waiting for you. I uh, So I finished this book last night. What, while you, you were waiting? It? I'm like 10 minutes late. You can't finish a book in 10 minutes. <laughs> no, I finished it last night. So I was oh, just like Googling the author. But you know this guy, Patrick Svensson? I only know Patrick Swayze and he's not even alive <laughs> anymore. Well, I have to tell you about this book. This is going to be your Christmas present this year. Oh, yeah? All right. So don't buy it for yourself because nope. okay. I'll buy it for you. Uh everyone wrecker makes he bought he bought me a book and then the next year he guilted me into buying him a book back so i apparently have to get record books at christmas Absolutely. Time. that's what we do that's a thing it's a tradition and n equals two is a tradition so this is your book this year it's this it's called the book of the a book the book of eels also known as the gospel of the eels i guess depending which country you get it it's named differently in english but it's patrick svensson i have to tell you wrecker if a book was written for me, this is it. Oh, it's okay. Like, totally. I totally want to read it then. Absolutely. It's like, first of all, it's a father-son story. Damn. And any father-son story, both with my own relationship with my father and my it just, you always hook me with that, right? So it's the father-son story. But then it's actually about eels. You know, the, the fish. The, it is the, literally the, about eels. It's about eels. So the guy talks about eel research and eels are this endangered species and they're this mysterious fish. And they're very like, yummy too. Have you ever eaten eel? Like I a, like Japanese unagi, but, but they're this mysterious fish. So he gets into a lot of science about the fish that is fascinating to me. And then he talks about thinkers. So Aristotle was oh. obsessed with the eel. Uh, uh, Freud was into the eel. So actually Thomas Grizzle, Tommy, our buddy gave me this book and I, I just, I it went a few months. Who the hell wants to read a book about eels, right? So I finally picked it up on my flight back from uh, California. I read this book in one day. Wow. It was, it was made for me. That's cool. I want to read it. My favorite character of the book is this guy, Johannes Schmidt. Okay. He started before World War One. Then had to pause for World War I and then continued to just try to find this spot. These eels all start in the same place. Uh, every eel in Europe, it gets its origins in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. This guy, Johannes Schmidt, had to like, he just went back and forth in the Atlantic Ocean for trying to find the eel spawning life. spot. That's kind of cool. Figuring out where these eels spawned. That wow. was his whole life. That's awesome. How romantically beautiful is that? A guy who spends his life on one scientific question. I well, mean, I, well, first of all, we do know a, a few of those people, right? Like the Brian Pennant of this world, the Ron Webbers of this world, you know, the hedgehogs. Nobody is Johannes Schmidt. This guy's next level. Read about him. You get, you'll get it in Christmas. So don't, you right. just plan. We have a we have a topic for today, but before we get there, since you picked up the father son and books and stuff, you know, like I'm a, a father of three boys, and you know, when my wife was pregnant with the first, I was on the whole let's figure out everything there possibly is to learn about the father son relationship. So yeah. I made playlists of music <laughs> about the father son relationship, like uh, my father's eye from Eric Clapton and that kind of stuff. And I yeah. read a whole bunch of books. I read every book I could find. Not not the What's the word? What's the book that you gave me, which was great? And the the way? No, what's the, the road. Book? The road. The road. Exactly, Cormac. Right? I like that. Cormac McCarthy. Um, all right, that's another. I, that's one of my favorite books of all time. Very, when very I finished, good. I read that in a day as well, and I actually went to bed with the book halfway through, and woke up at three in the morning thinking about. It. I had to pick the book back up and finish it. I, 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 I devoured more. that really, really quickly. Not in a day, but really quickly. So anyway, so I can't remember all the books I read, but the one that I do remember are the motorcycle diaries. You know that Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, or is this something yes. different? No, that's the one. Zen, the, yeah. the art of the motorcycle. You know, the motorcycle diary yeah. actually is by is about Che Guevara. I meet the artist of motorcycle uh, maintenance. That's a book that yeah. would speak to you as well, right? It's father son. Yeah, I read it. Long philosophy. Time ago. It's, it's cool. technology. Everything is in there. Yeah. Right. I haven't read that in a long time. He had. A, I loved it so much. I read the follow on book. I think it's called Lily or Lila or something like that. It was about no, a woman. It didn't. I didn't like that one as much. Uh, Okay, well, we jump, we're jump. we jumping, but we get back on track now. Now, here's the thing. So last episode, we talked about ChatGPT and its impact on the on the research enterprise. And folks, when we're recording, this is just out for a day. And we do get some feedback already. Apparently, people like it, which is good. And in that episode, we, we well, especially me, I jumped the lines every now and then and talked about researching ChatGPT as an object of study. 
right? So, yeah. I, you know, and you caught me there and said, like, dude, let's, you know, stay on track. But we all also said, like, let's talk about researching yeah. ChatGPT. Because so last had- time, yeah. last time we said these chat tools like ChatGPT in the research endeavor, like exactly. we as professors and research scientists, to what degree should we use them, rely on them, and how can we use them in our research? And now, Rekker, you're going to tell us about how we can use them as an object. Like, how can we do research on this stuff? On, it's the, on, it's the because, issue of our time. Exactly. Because you said, like, in the, we ended this episode by me saying, like, I don't want to research it. And I, I said, look, it's a red ocean. Everyone's researching it. And you said, and rightfully so, you said, look, you're a professor of information systems, you know? Like, how dare you not research it? This is the technology of our time, and it's impacting everyone around us. We have to know about it. You have to learn something about it. You know, we have to research it. And, of course, you're oh, right, yeah. right? So I, I spent a little time in, in thinking about it a bit more than I have because I said, like, look, I don't want to research it, and thinking about what could be research about it. Yeah. And, Wrecker, I have to tell you, you in particular, how can you look yourself in the mirror in the mornings? You're getting – these companies bring you out. They talk to you. You're, you've got the nucleus chair. I mean, you're not just any German dude. You're the guy with the nucleus chair professorship. I don't know why you're that up at, all the time. It's really not all that Because <laughs> I love it. impressive. At University of Hamburg, right? The nucleus freaking chair. The only better chair in Germany is our friend Jan Menling with uh, the Einstein chair, which I'll take the Einstein chair over the, the nucleus chair, but I'll take nucleus chair second if you give me a <laughs> yeah. chair in Germany. Uh, anyway. How do you look yourself in the mirror if you're not doing so, like know something about ChatGPT? Well, right, that you're right, and it's you know. So the firms do come up and ask, and uh, I do prepare. And uh, you know, I haven't researched ChatGPT per se, but you know, we've been doing this stuff research on AI uh, for a while, and I have as well. Um, some papers out, some are not, etc. And so forth. So you know, I, I do know a little bit about it, but no, I haven't. Like what I meant, I guess more precisely, I see a lot of people doing individual level experimental research on, I guess you could call that human computer interaction, and that right. makes total sense to do that because you know it's an it's a tool for everyone to use and individuals can use this and yes there is a person act interacting with an autonomous tool that can generate stuff and that from the hci perspective is irrelevant and you know it's the issue of our time as you say so that makes a lot of sense all i'm meant to say is well that is probably the one area of research that i wouldn't be particularly interested in um you're not an individual because, level researcher though yeah well that too right so first of all i would be more interested in firm level issues and we can talk about them but of course that is not meant to say that this is not worth researching or people shouldn't be doing it but i know and i take you know like there's people doing that already and they you know doing great experiments and they're finding out really relevant stuff and i can read that and i do and then i know stuff i'm just saying yeah. like i wouldn't you probably won't see an experiment on hci involving generative eye with with young wrecker on it that's all i'm saying you know yeah well you will with me because i'm all excited about experiments now i just learned i told you this Taufik taught me how to do experiments and so i'm like all excited about it and yeah I teach but, it but that's only because you're a kid in the candy store and it's like oh there's a new type of thing that i've never done before. of course that's exciting it's new it's like me doing patent data research that is the one project over the last two years that i love the most i was super it's super cool super exciting and everyone that has done you know brett greenwood probably looks at it and it's like well how boring is that you know but for yeah. me as a different new thing different and new is always good shiny yeah. You know? All right. So HCI research, I think that's the issue, right? Is is you have these chat GPT type tools, uh, and we already probably have a really good understanding of human computer interaction, but this is a different complexion somehow, right? Chat chat tools. Well, and that, that I think is the opportunity as well as the challenge. So we know a lot about human computer interaction and we've seen a lot of these types of experiments. Someone uses some computerized tool and they examine the effect of problem solving. And, you know, I think the, the opportunity there is to think about, all right, that might be different now. But of course, the challenge is in, is in theorizing the difference, right? Yeah. The, you yeah. know, not so much in the experiment and, or in the, even in the dependent variable. I think the challenge in that type of research is really to think about what exactly is different here. And then coupled with something that I said last time, in what is here a persistently different thing, a fundamentally different thing, not just a transiently different thing, like not what is different 
with this version of ChatGPT that I'm using, because the next version might just be different again, right? So we mentioned last time this issue of opacity and transient nature, and I think they really come to the forefront here, right? You really have to think about what are some fundamentally different things in this type of tool, computer tool that we're using, and thinking about how that really impacts you, you know, human computer interaction on a fundamental level. And I think that's that's yeah. actually really difficult, you know, because it, it puts the burden on the theorizing aspect, not so much on the experimental methodology. Like the experiment, how it envisages, is a pretty standard type of experiment in the lab, in the field, you know. Yeah, with that with that said, you know, I think it is interesting this uh, this algorithmic aversion thing, how it's very, you know, it's a huge area. And I actually as an editor just accepted a paper, I think conditionally accepted it. So it'll be coming out probably next year Hopefully. on uh an algorithmic aversion where they basically said, look, the one of the reasons you're getting so many conflicting algorithmic aversion findings is people mean different things by the term, right? You know, uh, so we, we could talk about that in the future, but th what's interesting is Deep Force wrote this paper, I think in 2015, 2016 in management science. And that's the one everyone cites and organization. Yeah. And what's funny is I don't think they really pay attention to the stuff in like the nineties, the decision support systems where people, some, they had a whole bunch of behavioral research on decision support systems. And when people use the decision support, when they went around it and all of that, and a lot of this algorithmic aversion stuff is rehashing that. But what's interesting is you can do it without, since no, but none of your reviewers have read the stuff in the nineties either you get in, <laughs> oh, no. right? And I think a lot of this algorithmic aversion stuff is recreating decision support systems, behavioral interaction stuff from way back when. So uh, with chat GPT though, you can't, you could probably ignore the decision support stuff, but you can't ignore the algorithmic aversion stuff, no. right? So, because it's really recent and all your reviewers are going to be, so you have to look at it and say, how's this different than like the deep forced algorithm? Or these I, I other think this is a particular case. Like I, I, I get the point where you're, you guys, you know, in Notre Dame, the group, why you're so interested in algorithmic aversion, because that is a clear example of a, a problem in the literature where we have this one theory saying it's bad. Then we have, you know, other types of research, like this other lady, uh, from I can't remember Wharton or somewhere where Georgetown. The, She's yeah, Georgetown. Georgetown. Appreciation. Uh, so yeah. and that is a classic problem, right? We say like, well, which one is it? So and then we need to figure that out. Not all HCI type of research on the individual level would be of that kind, right? Yeah. And and so that is an obvious opportunity because you have a clear problem in the literature. Yeah. Her name is Jennifer Log. She's at yep. Georgetown University. She's the one who did all the other algorithmic appreciation. Yeah. Exactly, right? So the question is now, under which conditions, for which task, in which constellation do we appreciate and or, you know, uh, avert algorithms, so to speak? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, you know what? I think it's a little bit more interesting um, is when you move from the individual to the group level. So when you think about groups of people interacting with a tool such as JetGPT. You remember in our Managing AI special issue, there was this one paper, yeah. Alok and Andreas Fugner, and they yeah, looked yeah. at... Um, a collective intelligence, like groups yeah. of people that either use an, an AI, not a generative AI, just an AI tool, a classification system like Google Images or something, um, mm -hmm. and then figure out that, well, you know, like it, it, it is better under certain condition, under a certain delegation constellation, but the, the crowd gets dumber, so to speak, right? Yeah. And I think that is an interesting one to also think about whether whether that still happens in, in a generative AI context. Yeah, so I think you know, the point here is that in a group constellation, first of all, there's different, more configurations, not just a person with or without a tool or with two different variants of a tool, like the experimental setup is a little bit more interesting, I think. And then you yeah. could have very, very different types of settings or dependent variables. Like, for example, I know in Hamburg, there's a group that, that looks at what if AI is not part of the group, but the facilitator? you know, the yeah. moderator of that group? And if so, how should it moderate the group so the group gets the best output? You run into a weird situation because it's generative. It's not necessarily going to moderate the group the same way each time. Exactly. So you're intro if you're doing an experiment, for example, you're going to introduce, uh, I guess, confounding issues. You're, you're, you won't have a controlled experiment the moment you let chat tools actually do what they're supposed to do. So what you'll need to do is create fake scenarios. So you're going to lose external validity so that it stays the same across the, you know, so that's a tough one. Exactly. You know what I was thinking from a group or a team level? So you're absolutely right. There's, you know, things like, uh, does the group get dumber and that. Um, but I was thinking like social network, 
Okay. There have always been multimodal networks where you have humans and then maybe you have a repository of a tool, but, but no one really cared about the technology. The technology wasn't ever really a node in the network. Uh, humans were, but with these chat tools, you know, you could look at how they change network, I guess, configurations or network dynamics. So it's not just maybe experiments. You could also look at, uh, I don't know, other approaches to team research. Yeah, I was I was thinking about that a couple of years ago when we when we did process research, right? Like, did, um, you know, action or event networks, not social networks, but action and event networks, like in the Brian Pentlet sort of tradition. And we yeah. at that time, right, it was on the horizon that we would get more and more autonomous tools, like like technologies that could act in a process just as like a human actor. But of course, they're not a human actor; they're different, right? They might be you know, more consistent, you know, as if you think of a robot, but of course, if you generate, it could be, you know, less, con whatever, right. They would have different characteristics. So back then we already thought about what happens if we take a typical human actor node and replace it with a, uh, with a, with a digital actor. Well, we've done that with automation forever, right? Yeah, you put yeah. ERP and that takes care of a, or whatever, right? So that takes care of a task. So how is that different by putting a chat GPT? I or think it's a, different. A right? So the traditional tra process technology, including the SAP example, weren't automating the task. They were automating the choreography of task. Like they were automating the workflow between tasks. They would assign the, the, the task would still be by different people. You know, SAP enterprise system, they're not doing the work for you. They're giving you a screen. And when you click submit, it ends up on my dev and I have to click yes or something, right? Yeah. But what about generate report? Generate report. It's a human generated it. Now we have a, a, a whatever reporting system generated out of SAP. So the the tool automates the thing the human used to do, uh, yeah. right? So how is the chat like? How do you turn generative chat or generative uh, AI tools into a research question that's different in an event network? than other automation right like is well, it different i guess i guess it would depend so if you take like again i would start with what is really different here so i'll take you one, to give you one example that's well known is the this um this feature or bug that it hallucinates you know it generates yeah. and it's basically non-verifiable because it, it sometimes it hallucinates on, on you know whatever sometimes by design sometimes by happenstance whatever but it hallucinates so and if you put a hallucinating node into an event into your process um, what happens to the process? You know, in certain processes, like say in creative processes, when you have a you know people doing reporting or people doing advertisement or other types of stuff where they generate content, um, you know, think of I don't know, maybe even news media reporting. What do you do if yeah. all of a sudden you have a note that can hallucinate, may hallucinate? Often, you know, you, how do you deal with that? I think that's an interesting one. What it then happens to the dynamics of the process? Think about news media reporting on social media, and then people post in comments, and you know, what what does it do to to the spread of fake news or not fake news or whatever? How do or would it change the process dynamics? I think that's an interesting one. Yeah, yeah, and well, and going back to I guess linking this to the HCI thing. So first of all, they're generative. So that's the key, is that they're they're not automating something they're automating something in a way where the in in the past all the automation we've done had a key outcome variable and you would hold that fixed and yeah. then you would automate the process for that fixed outcome yeah. uh, with generative tools the key distinction is that the outcome is not fixed or at least some part of the outcome is not fixed right so so that fundamental and that's why prompt engineering and stuff like that you know, is, is so with HCI, for example, uh, one way that I might change a traditional HCI study is that I would see what prompts people put in the system. And that would be one of my, you know, uh, see how to get people to change their prompts to be more inclusive or, or more broad, more narrow, you know, how you get humans to change their prompts. Well, so that the output that is generated maybe by the tool is maybe more consistent, less consistent, more listening, you know, it has different Well, that's problems. classic prompt engineering, but I'm talking about from a behavioral standpoint. So you flip uh, it. It's not so classic prompt engineering is how do you get the human or, or how do you get the prompts that make the outputs that you want uh, or the outputs that you want, given the prompts that people are going to use. What I'm talking about is prompt studying prompts, how humans create prompts, how we can nudge them to certain prompts over others. Right. So that might be a behavioral because in the past, output and input were fixed. Right. There were certain structured data I had to put in to my SAP or whatever. 
and that gave me a predictable output based on but the input. the issue that I see there, Nick, and and then challenge me on this one. But that would be may that could be one of these types of phenomena that are transient in the cells. How long will we have prompt engineers? Will they stay or will they not stay? Give you one example. Like at the moment, there's a lot of machine learning research, not on the machine learning algorithms, but on the data preparation work. You know, yeah. by 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 these, uh, the, I don't know what what do you call them? These data task forces that you get on these platforms, and you know all the issues around them. Well, there's now algorithms that don't need pre data labeling, right? And that takes the entire profession away, the takes the phenomenon away. And it could well be that prompt engineering is what did you call it? A stopgap? Like we need it now. Mm-hmm. Will we need it in the future, or will that phenomenon and thereby the research be out of date in 2024? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. So that's prompt honest. engineering, but that's different than prompt research. Like how do humans actually prompt? That's different than engineering prompts. But I think that's one difference. But then you move it up to the team level, which is what you're talking about. It's like, what's the difference? Well, typical traditional automations had kind of fixed inputs and a fixed output, at least format. And then they were maybe deterministic. This is generative. So you'll use it earlier in processes, I guess, and in ideational processes and, and their role in a process is different than historical automation. Uh, Yeah. Hallucinations. Again, we're IS, we're not going to necessarily do the technical side where we, you know, determine but it's a how. Social te- no, I don't want to like. Yeah. It, I don't think we do the research on fixing the hallucination. You know, some guy will yeah. come up with a technical solution for that. But at the moment, I think it's a socio technical issue because you have to account for the fact in your social constellation, in your pros or wherever, that there might be hallucination, and therefore you need to find some remedy, some mitigation strategy, yeah. and that's a socio technical issue. Like a process, how do what are the different processes the teams use for dealing with hallucinations and for exactly. validating the data well, before so they go? For example, do they do they do some sort of pre-validation, post-validation kind of thing? Like they add new tasks to a process that they otherwise yeah. would need to deal with the you know hallucination. Similar, like in a research process where you would have to add a, a validation, you know, a verification yeah. step at some stage because you can't trust the thing or it's not yeah. replicable enough or whatever, not robust enough. And comparing the validation with one of these tools to the validation when just a human does it right so so i guess this is just how our our brains work when we're you and i when we're thinking through all right if we were to do research on this you always have to distinguish between this and other tools you can't just say it's chat gpt therefore it's new yeah. you have to be like okay so what is the thing all right so we hit a little bit at individual level a little bit at group level or process level right what is that is there an oh. org level yeah, like oh, of course, I think at the at the firm level, I think is is really where the the uh, issues get exciting. I think so. Uh, but, but first, the, the, usually the first firm level research that people do in our field about any new technology is is adoption. <laughs> and and uh, you know, normally you would say like, look, we have blockchain adoption model, we have this model, AI adoption model, and so forth. And and normally everyone goes like, oh God, not again! You'll just reinforce something we've known for thirty years. But him. Me out. Isn't the adoption curve different here? I mean, it's the you know the quickest adoption, the steepest adoption. Maybe it's a different curve altogether. Maybe it's not even an S curve anymore. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe there's enough difference in the adoption pattern that warrants a new investigation of adoption. I'm not. I'm not sure, mm. but it could be. A and the ca- key is not adoption binarily. It's not one or zero. Which do you use it or don't you? Let's just assume everyone's using it at this point. Most knowledge workers are in some form or another. So the question is not whether you use it or not. It's how you use it, to what extent you use it, for which tasks you use it, uh, what outcomes you're getting for the tasks you're using it for, right? And then you aggregate that up to the organizational level. Are you make, are people more more productive like, can you measure productivity? Can you measure job replacement? Are people, do we need fewer employees, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I but at the same time, it also has spawns a couple of interesting consequences. So for example, when you talk to media companies, they're all using it already. You know, Hamburg mm-hmm. is a haven for uh, PR and marketing agencies in Germany. They're all there and they're all using it, of course, right? To create all sorts of commercials, text, visual, anything really. What if everyone's doing that? Wouldn't that lead to some sort of mimetic isomorphism that any competitor, you know, like it could lead to some really interesting diffusion patterns and economic consequences of that if 
you're not the first because really there's no, you know, early adopter advantage because everyone jumped on it within a couple of weeks. You know, you know what I mean? Like, so there, there could be some interesting issues in firm level adoption that could be worth looking at again, even though we've done that type of research for a long time. I think you're, that's interesting. So when you say mimetic, you're talking about diffusion of innovation. And yep. this is the classic DiMaggio and Powell. This is institutional theory, right? There, there are coerce, uh, and their whole argument is that organizations, this is isomorphism, organizations start looking the same. Yep. And why is it organizations like banks and hospitals and these different or all start looking the same and all banks look exactly the same and all hospitals look and they're starting to look like each other. Well, their argument is, well, there are three things. One, coercive, which is, you know, you have to. the EU, EU yeah, mandates to. certain things, uh, certain processes, certain compliance. Right? So that makes people look the same. From Then there's normative, which is the professions um, and the university systems. And so this is classic. Those are the two pressures that come from outside of the organization that force them to kind of look the same. Uh, then there's mimetic, and this is the one that's internal. It's not a pressure, it's a process. So, and it's that the people in the organizations imitate each other because they're faced with uncertainty. They're not sure what to do and they imitate each other. So what you just said was actually really cool. Is that a mimetic process? I don't think so because they're not, they're not actively imitating each other. They're kind of passively imitating each other. Yeah. It's almost like a, a fourth thing or maybe a type of normative where what you're doing is you're by adopting these tools, you're you end up being you end, you up, end up being the, the same because yeah. yeah, you're feeding the tool. It's giving you the same output it's giving the other firms. So now that tool is giving it's it's got this homogenizing uh, well, effect. You know, you know why I thought about it is because I, I happen to reread again Nicholas Carr IT doesn't matter argument from the yeah. two thousand yeah. right where he really? basically said that um, you know IT and he was talking more about this wave of enterprise system like sort of SAP everyone every company every big company started using SAP and that eroded every competitive, but that was his main argument. Uh, you know, IT has become a commodity resource, not a superior, not a unique, inimitable resource. Everyone started looking the same and you you lose any competitive advantage you may have had from, you know, better, better procurement or better distribution process or anything like that, right? And I was thinking, well, yeah. well, in, in some way, this is the same because if everyone knows in, in the media industry and in some of these in, in news industries, if everyone now uses these tools, then you're also not going to gain any competitive advantage. On the other hand, well, it's not the same, is it? I mean, it's really not the same as every company using SAP because your competitors also use SAP. That that yeah. mimetic is, is not happening. It's not that media company A is doing it because they know that media company B is doing it. They all just yeah. jumped on it. Um, but And if you look, you mentioned Nicholas Carr, you look at all the folks who argued with Nicholas Carr afterwards. That was every IS person for about four years wrote a response to Nicholas Carr. That is true. And in general, the thread that ran through all of them was, uh, yeah, if technical systems were deterministic, then sure, there would be no difference. The thing is, people use them much differently and to much, you know, Walmart uses it much differently than, say, Whatever. Some and I think this is a nice little, you know, like one program of work that actually uncovers this also well is this productivity paradox, like a brilliant one. Yeah. Hit. The first paper basically, yeah, yeah, exactly. Basically, first they said, look, there's this paradox. We don't gain much. And then literally like the year later, well, we thought about it some more and we looked at it a little bit more closely. And, you know, if you look at the, the change it imposes it like five process. years later. Exa yeah, I know. It takes a while. Wasn't it like 1994, the product, and then 1999 or 98 or something? Was well, the, you know 93 it 93 to 98? We have to look yeah. these up. Yeah, I, I'll put them on the show notes. But you're right. There's four or five years between them. But, but of course, the reason is that, you know, the, 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 there's review process and so forth. But the key point is, of course, as soon as you're digging a little bit more into the mechanisms, then you realize that they – that people use these tools quite differently and some of them let them change their processes and ways of working, let new capabilities emerge. And if so, then that yields all sorts of productivity improvements and those that failed to adopt didn't, right? Yeah, and it's not failed to adopt, it's how they adopt. So firm level, how they adopt, which roles they use it, how they use the, right? It's all about the organizational processes and the humans adopting yeah. the undifferentiated technology, right? So, so the other thought, thought that I had as, a, as I'm 
you know, I, I see two things happening with firms at the moment. One of them is they, um, I guess you can call them first level and second level effects. One of them is like they want to use ChatGPT basically as part of their offerings. Like if you're a media company, you start using it to produce different or, you know, more automated text, something like that. But then, of course, there's also the secondary effects about productivity improvements because you can write that letter better. Or the classic example is that I know many people that have their emails entirely written or at least drafted by ChatGPT. Or in fact, That's you get awful, a too, isn't it? Well, or, or I know people that have a like executives that get too long to read emails and they throw them into ChatGPT. It's like give me give me three bullet points. You know, and then the stuff well, like this. Well, you know this. what's happening now? I just I was just meeting with some folks at Dropbox, and they're announcing their new uh, Dropbox AI. It's pretty sweet. He was showing me this stuff, and it's like you put stuff in your Dropbox folder. First of all, if there's a document there and you don't have time to read the actual document, you just say, hey, give me a one paragraph summary of this document. Holy and God. it'll put it right in the little Dropbox window next to the, so you're looking at your folder, it's folder level. It'll tell, you can be like, give me a summary of the main points from this folder. And there could be 20 documents in there and they'll bring up the summary of the folder. You can search entire folders based on, uh, so Dropbox AI is pretty cool. And it's like, so we're talking about ChatGPT now, wow. the big frontier of these uh uh, then we were actually, you know, I was just in California. We were talking to folks from Google. They're all about Bard, putting Bard into all the Google tools, the Google Office, we, Dropbox, and their AI. They're using uh, Microsoft's. They're doing ChatGPT, basically, right? Uh, and the other one was Amazon. Amazon has two chat tools that they want to start incorporating with their Amazon Web Services. So we were talking, to, and uh, and what's happening? The the current spot is these generic tools. You're working with your email. You're doing all this. Clearly, the next thing they're doing is niche. Dropbox is going to have the Dropbox generative tools for journalists, right? Yeah. Then they're going to have the whatever, uh, uh, you know, Google's going to do something for influencers and content creators, right? So what they're doing is they're going to make very customized generative tools for very specific niches. And that's where the next arm race is going to be. Because now they've all figured out the LLM stuff. They all have plenty of data. There's not going to be a huge differentiator there. But let me ask you this. So in the American firms, like the European firms, they all have, you know, European data regulation, right? GDPR and stuff like this. So the, one of the first things they all worry about is, well, can we actually use that instance in itself, or do we need to create some sort of copy and our own instance of the LLM? And then on top of that, our own version of ChatGPT, you know, they're basically building their little isolated pools in which they, yeah. they don't actually yep. use ChatGPT per se. Is that the same in the US? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the laws are. I don't know what the differences would be in the U.S. Uh, versus. I know that uh, people won't tell you what they trained it on, so we don't know what data these firms. Because trained. one obvious thing that that stems from this, whether you're in the EU or the U.S., of course, at some stage could be security breaches, privacy yeah. issues. You know, all these things at the firm level that can really happen yeah. once you once that AI becomes a really part of the day to day digital infrastructure. You know, at the moment, we have these sort of issues with, I don't know, like in, in Europe at the moment, there's a lot of the digital banks. They all run on the same server technology, and that, there's an issue with the server technology. So at least five of the That's major banks don't have online banking. And it's not their fault. It's an underlying tech mm -hmm. issue. And that'll imagine the same thing with an AI being part of that infrastructure. And then you realize there's some issue there. Um, and that may may not, you know, like in Europe, there would be the issue of, oh, that's not even in Europe anymore. You know, like we don't have any legal control anymore and, and stuff like that. So that could be an well, issue. And, and I think that the number one issue with researching uh, these generative tools, and we've talked about this in the past, and, you know, it was really the big thing last week with when we talked about the uh, uh, generative tools in the research enterprise. Uh, you you can't avoid ethical discussions right wow. you need to um and i think that's we, we talked about this this should be i did it with my phd students here recently so i got up to speed on ethics and technology ethics so if you want we can do a podcast on on what i learned uh these last couple of months on ethics and technology ethics but i think that is the big research um because a lot of these questions we're talking about end up having some sort of ethical uh implication don't they and they and do. that's 
AI and you, you the mo whether you use it, whether it replaces human labor, should it replace? I mean, it's getting to the point. These questions always existed, but they're they're getting they're taking a different complexion now. I think, right? Yeah. Maybe can I can I pitch one more on that level? Um, and that is again like just because I I happen to work in this area in this notion of let's call it AI and entrepreneurship. Um, you remember that we want, we once had a paper, we considered a paper that was basically looking, what is different if your startup is building AI, if there's difference, yeah. in, if anything, and you know, that paper didn't make it. Um, but I think that question is still not sufficiently answered. There's a really nice paper by Dom Chalmers in entrepreneurship about AI and entrepreneurship. And he looks about the stages in the entrepreneurial process from, you know, opportunity discovery, ideation, you know, prospecting, blah, blah, blah you know, until prototyping. And then at some stage you go to the market and he was writing about, you know, what could be different in AI, but he wrote it a couple of years ago at a time when AI was really different, like much like our own managing AI paper, oh, right? We would yeah, have write, yeah. we would write a different paper now, I guess. Um, but I do think that's an issue. Like that is an, an area that is really interesting to look at AI in the venture creation process. Like how do firms come into being, not just how do existing incumbent firms deal with AI, but also what about the startups? And, you know, we have lots of them. We've never had more startups and more st AI startups than ever before. So in the past, this type of research was hampered by the fact that it was really difficult to get a case. You know, find a yeah. firm. Now you have, you know, they're, they're left, right, and center. I know at least 30 AI state startups, right? So you can do yeah. that type of work now. And I do think, I don't know what the answer is, but I do think the question is worth asking, is there anything different? If so, what is different in the venture yeah. creation process under these conditions? Absolutely. And I think the one thread that we have to run through this is that what are generative tools? Yeah, they're just automation of tasks. And we've had automation of tasks forever. Right. Since Karl Marx before, since Adam Smith, right? Uh, since forever, uh, humans have always been automating their tasks. So on the one hand, knowledge we already have already applies to this too. But there is something different about these what generative tools. Isn't see, like, see, I don't know. Yeah. Like I'm oh, usually skeptical with this. And yeah. you know, they, they, there are these people saying this is the fifth industrial revolution and the sixth and the seventh. You know, like, I'm usually not stuff. one of them because it's so. What 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 I'm hearing is so it's like, well, I want to see that. Like, show me what is the yeah. difference in kind. Well, how is this different from, let's say, what the farm was to farmers in you know the 18th century yeah. or whatever, right? So, yeah. how is this different and what is different? I do think that verdict is still out because on some level, you're right. This is just automation. It's just maybe now we're automating different tasks, right? So in the past, we automated robots, you know, like robots took over part of the job in the in the industry, in the factory of cars. Yep. Clearly, That's it. Who wanted it's the to same. Do this. Automation is automation. So, so if you're going to write a paper on chat GPT or on these generative tools, the key is to say, now what's different? Oh, yeah. And I think that's the key to doing research and publishing here. And and you know, if you remember, I know you have, we have to stop soon, but just one. We do have to go. And then I was going to try and eat something before my, which is not going to happen now. Not going to happen because <laughs> I worked out this morning. I'm doing this CrossFit, and you know, I I threw up series. Did you bench press, Wrecker? Not as much anymore, but yes. I'm not going to so say how much. <laughs> huh? I'm not going to well, tell, tell you how much, how much I I threw up. I'm going to brag now. I got 250 pounds up twice today and 260 pounds up once. I didn't get this. So here, let me tell you what that is. And uh, no one knows what kilograms. it is. What is it like 120 kilos or something? That's a lot. I don't think it's probably more like 110 or something here. Two, 250 kilo, 250 pounds is 113 kilos. I did that twice. Yeah. And then, uh, you know what I'll do? Like 16. I go to the gym later tonight. I'll 117. Try so 118. I did 118 once. All right. You, you're going to beat me tonight. I, I actually have plans of going to the gym tonight after this, and I will go bench press, and I will go put 110, 120, and I'll ask some random dude to film me, and then I sh can show you whether I bench press 110. I doubt it. Uh, yeah. All right. And then whatever you bench press, I'm going to beat next time. Okay, fair enough. We'll do a little bit of a competition. Give me one minute, just one final thought, because it's an experience we made in the managing AI special issue because we did push all the authors teams to theorize about what's different with AI. Remember that? We said, like, we want you to theorize about the differences in AI as a piece of technology. And right. my lesson learned was that was seriously difficult for hard. everyone, including us, of course, we're no different, but everyone struggled with this task. So when we now say here, like we need to theorize what's different with generative AI, that is not as simple. That is that is a non-trivial task. 
right? So you, we can't yeah. just do that in a snap because we've had some of the best author teams and they worked years. It's difficult. And to be doing. honest, not all of them did, you know, like there's more to be theorized about. Let's put it this way, right? Yeah. All right. Now back to the important stuff, the bench pressing. You do realize, so I did 118 kilograms today once, but I was going for twice and I did not get two. That doesn't mean that's the most I can do. So after I see whatever the hell you put up. already finding excuses. and I I'm going to beat it. Yeah, sure. I'm going to beat it. So I still have a chance to beat whatever you can put up once. So I've done, I'm have i at 118 kilograms. Let's well, see. We have you. this intellectually inspiring episode here, like really lots of food of thoughts and ideas for people. And now you're coming up with this, with this, with, I don't even know this alpha male bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Send me the video and All then right. I can still beat it. And whatever you send me is your max. That has to be my goal. All right, and then I want to. Well, you know, but whatever you whatever you do, I'll I'll beat that as well. Also, no, people, you have no, to put <laughs> this is not going online. It's is it like whatever we're doing here is between Nick and me, and not. Me. <laughs> All right, all right. Hey. all right. Talk to you, brother. Next time. Later on.